Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming here today. My name is Molly Silberberg. I work here at BAM in the Education and Humanities Department, which organizes these conversations in addition to our literary programming and master class series. We're really thrilled to be co-presenting the On Truth and Lies series with the Onassis Cultural Center of New York of the Onassis Foundation USA. We're so grateful for their support, and I want to especially acknowledge Ambassador Lucas Silas, Executive Director, and our programming partner, Amalia Kosmatatu, Director of Cultural Affairs. On Truth and Lies and Feminism is part of the Hellenic Humanities Program here at BAM, which is a new initiative to further Hellenic ideals and culture into the 21st century, and it marks our expanded partnership with the Onassis Cultural Center in New York. So I hope I will see you all at our programming in the future. Um, I want to welcome all of you he who are physically here today, and then also we have a live stream going on right now. So I want to welcome everyone who may be watching us online. Um, and also, if you didn't get enough in the room today, it will be live as soon as you go home, so you can rewatch the entire talk all over again. Um, so for those of you who are watching us online, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. And you can tweet at us at bam underscore Brooklyn. So we hope to hear from you. For those of you who haven't seen A Doll's House yet, I really highly encourage you to check it out. It's running at the Harvey Theater through uh, next Sunday. So if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, it's really worth seeing. And this conversation will give you some great context and some great fodder for conversation when you go see it. I have the pleasure of introducing our guests for today. Anne-Marie Slaughter is the president and CEO of the New America Foundation and the Bert G. Kurtzetter 66 University Pre Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. She has served as the Director of Policy Planning for the U.S. Department of State, the Dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, and the J. Sinclair Armstrong Professor of International Foreign and Comparative Law at Harvard Law School. In 2012, she published the very thought-provoking article in The Atlantic, Why Women Still Can't Have It All, in, and she lives in Princeton with her husband and two sons. Um, hosting the conversation this afternoon is Simon Critchley, the Hans Jonas Professor at the New School for Social Research. He is the author of more than a dozen books, including the most recent work, Stay, Illusion, The Hamlet Doctrine. In addition to being the moderator of the On Truth and Lies series, he is the moderator of The Stone, a popular online philosophy column for the New York Times. So there will be time for questions following their conversation, so I encourage you all to start thinking what questions you may have, and for those of you watching online, we want to hear your questions as well. So again, at BAM underscore Brooklyn on Twitter, we'll try and get your questions in. So with that, that's enough for me. I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed panelists for today. Good evening. Um, so I had this elaborate plan, and I got up at 6 o'clock this morning. I've been making notes, and I've got notes on lots of things. And I think I might just, we were having such a nice conversation downstairs, we might just continue the conversation. But let's just start with A Doll's House. And um, if you've not seen it, it really is good. There's been an awful lot of. There's an awful lot of bad Ibsen, or Ibsen, because the play, I love Ibsen, and Ibsen's plays are extraordinary. Particularly this kind of sequence, Doll's House, Ghost, Head of Gabler, Master Builder, and um, they're often really badly done. And Doll's House is extraordinary because there are two kind of heroes. There's uh, Hattie Morahan, who's the lead actor, who really is something else. I'd never heard of her before, but it's really, really strong. Yeah, he liked it. She's, she's really something else. And what she brings to that role is amazing. And there's a baby. There's a baby on stage which appears and disappears. And uh, I was very intrigued by the baby. Apparently, I found there are three babies. I heard. That's theatre, right? Anyway. So, um, Doll's House was a hugely controversial play when it was um, first performed in 1879. And I was just saying to Anne-Marie that um, when it was performed in Germany, around that little bit after that time, actresses refused to play the role because they, they thought it was too, too radical, uh, that she would leave her kids, and another ending was added to the play. So it's a play that's been you know, uh, linked to the, the history of feminism. And I guess our first question would be in relation to our theme of whether you, whether you liked the production, what you thought of it, and I guess, 
whether it's a feminist drama and what might that mean? We could just maybe begin with those kind of ah. bundle of things. So the production is really fabulous, and uh, Hattie Morin as Nora is mm -hmm. magnetic. You you can like her or not, but you can't take your eyes off of her. And and yeah. so uh, it was marvelous. I remember reading A Doll's House probably in college and hadn't focused on it since, so nobody should worry. We're not going to do an Ibsen quiz here. Uh, no. But... You know, yeah, of course it's a feminist play. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a feminist play for uh, when it was written without any question. And the, all the standard tropes are there. I mean, the whole theme that she's a little bird, right? Yeah. Her husband treats her as a child, as a very sexy child. Uh, so he calls her my little bird, uh, my, my little swallow. And yes. of course, that's the cage. Right? Mm -hmm. She's a little bird, and she's in a cage. She's in that. She's she's or a doll in a house. Either either one, and that theme, <laughs> you'd you'd have to be so obtuse, uh, unimaginably obtuse, mm -hmm. not to get that. Uh, yeah. uh, that, and and also the way she uses her sexuality to get what she wants because she has no other power. So the opening scene, she has no money. Mm -hmm. She has her body. She uses it. Uh, she uses all the what when I grew up in the South were called the feminine wiles mm -hmm. to get what she wants out of her husband. And those are the standard feminist tropes of being right. objectified, of not be having, I was thinking about the money, Virginia Woolf's, if you want to be a writer, you have to have an income and a room of one's own. Well, she has neither. Yeah, exactly. uh, so in those senses, uh, yes. And then, it, you know, the, the sort of standard arc of the play, without any digging around underneath, she... Uh, comes to the recognition that, in fact, she is not her own person. Then mm -hmm. this is, again, a standard feminist uh, language, that the woman is defined in terms of relationships to others. A woman was a daughter, you know, a, a daughter first, and a sister, uh, and then a wife, and then a mother, and in that order, if sister, if you had siblings. Uh, and that's all she is. That's the sum total of a woman. She's defined by her relations to others, by the care and love she gives others. And a man is defined as his own entity, as an agent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and oh, what the standard way to think of the play is she, over the course of the play, she realizes, wait a minute, I'm tired of being your doll. Mm -hmm. She says at the end, I was my father's doll and I was your doll. And now I'm going to become my own person. Yeah. And so I'm going to sever those relationships and I am then going to, uh, and I'm going to sever my marriage, and I'm going to leave my children, mm -hmm. and I will go off and be educated and become my own person. Yes. So, yes. you know, if you didn't think that was feminist, <laughs> uh, there's much more to it. But, yeah, but, uh, yeah for, for its time, it was a feminist manifesto. And um, what do you think's changed? Because I mean, one way, there was a production of... Um, Enemy of the People uh, last autumn here, and the guy that was directing it talked about the scandal of Ibsen, and the scandal of Ibsen for him was that it was still relevant. We should be, yeah. we should be out of that world. We should be out of that late nineteenth-century world, way beyond it. But he said that we're not. Now, with a play like A Doll's House, do you think we are? Do you think, it, it, in a sense, it's it's a wonderful drama? and so on and so forth, but do you think it's still relevant to uh, the condition of women now, or would you say that things have changed? Another, another thing which is, dominates the play is the question of money and debt. I mean, if you don't, I mean, she signs a fraudulent loan, she forges her father's signature and gets this money in order to help her husband recover from an illness which is caused by overwork. So the theme of work, money and debt resound in this play, as in many plays by Ibsen. Now, we live in a world of debt, right? And uh, a world where money, in a sense, money rules all. But do you think that conditions have changed for a Nora now than a Nora back then? So is there a scandal, as it were? So I had one answer last night and mm -hmm. another today. Okay. And I'll explain okay. why. So I saw the show uh, with my husband and the elder of my two sons, uh, who wants to be an actor and is, uh, was thrilled with the performance, but also the two of them have seen a lot of theater together. And so mm -hmm. we were driving home back to Princeton. And my husband's reaction was, gee, you know, it's just so dated. 
right? In fact, he was right. trying to explain to my son, you know, what a big deal it was in those mm -hmm. days to leave your husband. He said, you know, today, obviously, 50% divorce rates. This just, mm -hmm. there's no bang to the ending at all. I mean, so, okay, so she's, she is awakened and she wants to leave her husband and children, and then the question today would be, well, who has custody and how do they work that out? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, right. uh, you know, so he was really, you know, it just, it doesn't resonate. And my son was like, no, 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 you put yourself, the, this production is so good, you really feel like you are living then and you understand that tension. Mm -hmm. But still, I would have said, the issues we are fighting with have w moved way beyond that. We are, uh, and so, um, it's a feminist play for an earlier, earlier era. It doesn't resonate today. And then I watched the director, Carrie Crack, Cracknell's short called Nora. So she, she, it's a 15 minute short mm -hmm. uh, and it is the modern Doll's House. And it shows a woman, every working woman in the audience is, watches the first five minutes of this and you are, somebody's nodding. You're like, yes, that's my life. She's on the phone talking to the bank, trying to get her two children fed and mm -hmm. lunch made and get dressed all at the same time. Uh, so she's holding the, you know, holding the phone. She has to put it down to pull the shirt over her. The kid drops stuff on the floor. Yeah. She's cleaning up. She's talking. She gets them late, of course, to the caregiver. Uh, and then she races off late, of course, to the big meeting. Mm -hmm. She does what I do still almost every day. She changes her shoes outside the building. She runs in, puts her makeup on in the bathroom, scrambles and heads into work where she, um, where she is immediately confronted by a row full of guys. Right. And one of the guys says, the, the lead guy says, well, I got, a heads, I got a heads up from your male colleague at the club over the weekend. All still true. Old Boys Network, no questions, still operating. She's clearly, she's, she, you know, they mark her down for being late. They mark her down for, for sort of not being one of them. Uh, she then goes home. She's dragging the kids. She's way late to meet the caregiver. She puts the kids on, out in the back on a sort of trampoline with a with a net and a zipper. So another they, cage, right? Yeah, another cage. No question. She goes in. She says she wants to make phone calls. Her kids clearly want her to be with them. She's not. Mm -hmm. And then the, her husband she comes does. home from the business trip, and she's not there. And the last, the last bit, uh, she's, she's gone, mm -hmm. and she's holding uh, her kids' toys, and, and you know she's gone. And suddenly I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? We, we, that's the doll's house today. Now, mm -hmm. it raises so many questions, though, because, yeah, but she chose that life. Mm -hmm. Nora did not choose. She had no Nora in a doll's house. That's what she did. She had to get married. She didn't have any choice. The argument today is, well, no, she didn't have to be that. She could be home. You know, she could work differently. But is it, aren't we still maybe just as subject to an awful lot of deeply gendered constraints? Um, so yeah. we're, we're still there. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a very interesting response. And also at the center of this play is, um, is a marriage. Yes. And a marriage between a man who, and I wrote this down just because it, it was the kind of key line at the end of the play, where when, when it becomes clear, when the, they receive a letter from Krogstad, who's the guy with the IOU, and um, he says, you know, it's, everything's fine, I've torn up the IOU, you're off the hook. He says, we're saved, we're saved, we're saved. And, uh, He's this sort of selfish, narcissistic, whatever. And at that point, I mean, Nora is, is hugely disappointed and he's just been lambasting her for she's as bad as her father, they're all bad because of the, she's a bad stock, doesn't understand religion or morality and whatever. And then she says um, she was expecting a miracle. She was expecting a miracle and the miracle didn't happen. And um, and the miracle would have been that he would have taken the blame onto himself for what happens in the play. He would have taken the blame for... And, and then she would have said, no, no, it's all my fault, right? And that would have been how it went. And then he says, um, Torvald says, no one sacrifices his honor for the one he loves. No one sacrifices his honor for the one he loves. And so Torvald puts his public reputation above his private relationship. At that point, the marriage is over. She walks, she's gone. So in a sense, this is also um, a play about the difficulty of marriage 
and what and disappointment with love, right? Which hasn't yes. really changed that much. Yes, but this is where sh also then then we start you know peeling back the layers, which mm -hmm. is why Ibsen's a great playwright and then mm -hmm. didn't uh, because. She's the narcissist in the marriage, in my view. She's okay. more narcissistic than he is. He's, he's a man of his times, and he's deeply in love with her, but he is much more focused on her than she is on him. She is, as I, that's one reason the, the production is so great, because, as I said, Hattie Moran, you can't take your eyes off her, but the whole play, every interaction she's in is always all about her. Yes. Indeed, there's this scene early on where her childhood friend shows up and uh, walks in, and she hasn't seen this woman forever, and this woman's had all sorts of problems in her mm -hmm. life, and her, you know, her mother's died, and her husband's died, and all sorts of things. And of course, Nora just starts talking about what's happened in her, Nora's life. And mm -hmm. at some point she says, and we all have friends like this, uh, if we keep them as friends, oh yes, uh, you know, I forgot to ask you. And so it's in that, that marriage. My mother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, we met. How are you, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe better there, than the undergraduate who said to me, uh, you don't want your mother to need you, right? There's other right. sides, right? So, so the, the overprotective side, but uh, yeah. we won't go there. No. <laughs> but, but the point being, she is, she's a narcissist. It is all about her. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is what she wants out of life and what she wants. She wants the money. She wants you know, to, to manipulate her husband in various ways. And then she has this image of marriage where, yes, I, the miracle's gonna happen that he will jump forward and save her. It's a classic white knight, you know, the prince is gonna rescue her. And then, but that's not enough because then she's not the center of that frame, right? If the, if the, if the prince rescues her, then the prince is the center of the frame. So she'll then come forward and, and save mm -hmm. him. So I, but at that moment, you also think, wow, he may have his faults, but, he is more, far more in love with her than she is with him, and he would not upend the whole relationship to go search for himself as she is going to do for herself. Mm -hmm. And that, so first place, it sort of changes the way you think about their marriage, mm -hmm. but it also, it, it got me thinking about something that, that, is, that, that is true today of women more than men, which is that it's, m women are much more likely if they don't like a job or they're unhappy, there's, no, you know, there's not enough meaning in what they're doing, mm -hmm. to stop. I mean, I was a law professor for 12 years. I know many of my students who were not thrilled about working in large law firms. To stop doing that and go do something else, right? To find, they're more willing to take those risks. The guys who may, equally not like working at large law firms or large uh, any places, are much more likely to say, I got to do it. I have to do it. Mm -hmm. I have to support my family. And so right. uh, you know, that, that sort of shift in the way I thought about him and the way I thought about her made me think about that. That's interesting. I mean, would you say, because there are, you know, she, we, she's a flawed, she's not perfect, and Nora. I kind of love <laughs> women like Nora, but there is something. She's not, she's not flawed. She's a liar. She's a criminal. She eats candy when she's not meant she, she, I mean she, she's always pushing these 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 boundaries and there's something there's nothing about nothing wrong with eating candy nothing wrong <laughs> nothing wrong no but it's it's yeah and um but she's i want to sort of get to a question which is you know raised by the piece in the in the atlantic which is about intergenerational responsibility in relation to feminism and let me try and set that up in a different way that um, in the play, there's Nora, mm -hmm. um, who, let's say, is around, how old is Nora? 30? Probably. Like, probably around 30. 30. Yeah. yeah. And then we have, there's a serving girl right. who only gets a, a first name. We don't know what her second name is. There's uh, Christine Lind, the friend who's from The Loveless Marriage, who turns up sort of destitute and lo looking for a job. And uh, there's the nanny. Right. The nanny who's running the household. Who was Nora's mother, effectively. Yeah, it right? had to be Nora's she, mom, that's she right. She took care of Nora from the beginning. Exactly, so there's this kind of class status right. Right. structure around this, this woman who's the center of things. And um, 
there's, I think there's two questions related to that, which you can, you can pick out of the air how, how you wish, which is that the, um, there's a, in the Atlantic piece, you say, I made my notes, somebody go to my notes. It was, um, yeah, the, 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 some of the hard truths that you, you deal with in the, in the piece, you say, I realize what should have been obvious, ha having it all, having it all, at least for me, depended entirely on what type of job I had. The flip side is the harder truth. Having it all was not, po not possible in many types of jobs, including high government office, at least not for very long. So in a sense, there's this question of, um, of feminism in relationship to uh, what job one has as an academic or where one's a, a nanny or whatever. And then there's this question linked to that that I want to get to, which is this question of the relationship between feminists of, say, your generation and then women of a, another generation, let's say in their 20s and 30s, some of whom are out there, who might or might not identify as feminists, right? And, the sense, and there's a question that your, your piece raises as to whether, not that you've betrayed that generation, but in a sense, there's a question about this, you know, having it all idea, which is kind of uh, produced an expectation which is kind of unbearable, or it's just too high. And what about, the, the, there are two kind of sets of questions there. Yeah. Intergenerational <laughs> stuff and... And... Oh, what was the first one I was talking about? <laughs> oh, the, uh, class, I guess class. You know, there's having it all for certain women. Um, in this yes. case, Nora can yes. go out yes. and have it all. Yes. But then there's the servant, right. there's the nanny, right. there's the, uh, the woman from the loveless marriage who needs to work in a bank. Yes. And this question of the economic inequality, yeah. which right. subtends okay. these, yeah. Let, let me, let me, so... Let me, let me take them in sequence. The, the economic inequality uh, is absolutely, the whole conversation mm -hmm. about having it all is an upper middle class conversation uh, and, and today probably increasingly a 1% combination, uh, conversation. Uh, and indeed the, um, I mean, 77 percent of American women work, uh, and, and that, well, all American women work. But 77 percent of and, um, American women work, uh, you know, outside the home, uh, and the vast majority do not have choices about staying home. They have to work. Now, for those women, even though still, and and you know. Two million people read the Atlant my Atlantic article. Two Amazing. million people, right? It's the right. most read article ever. And countless people wrote to me. It expanded way beyond the audience I was write thought I was writing for. I knew I was writing for a quite elite audience, and I said so, and I felt bad about it. But I'm not, I'm not a, I, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't research this. I'm not mm -hmm. a labor economist. I mean, all I could do was write about my own experience. Uh, but, but what resonates, I think, for for millions and millions and millions of women. Uh, is is still the trade-off of you may still have to work, but do you put your career first? Do you put your family first? Do you mm -hmm. defer the promotion? Do you take the job that allows you to be more flexible uh, rather than the job that might advance uh, your, your career? Uh, that said, um, one of the things that I'm I'm fixated on in the book that I'm writing is how to reunite the experiences of the women at the top and the women at the bottom. Because uh -huh. this conversation, when it started, uh, and if you go back and read Gloria Steinem, she sees the women's movement as a movement for all women. She sees right. all women having the same essential experience of being mothers and that tying them and this liberating them to be defined not only by their relationships but also by their, their professional identities. And now we've gotten to a place where my experience is radically different than the woman who takes care of my children while I'm at work, much less the single mother who is there who, who, trying to do both at the, the same time uh, at, at lower income. So uh, going forward, I think a great deal about how are we going to frame this issue so that we, we once again push for policies that don't just advance women of my generation and privilege to be CEOs, 
but, pro but provide what I call the infrastructure of care that is necessary to both lift women who are single mothers out of poverty and to prevent the millions of women who are middle class and on what Maria Shriver calls on the brink. Uh, and I, I think that's a very important thing going forward, which yeah. we can talk about further. I want to talk about, yeah, the, uh, as we're policy questions as well, uh, uh, very much as it's very important. And it's, it's, um, but what about this intergenerational yeah, question so about the, yeah, I mean, because you, how do you, how does that, how do you see that? So the question I get always everywhere is, did you have any idea that your, this article would take off like that? Uh, and I always say, no, it is not possible to imagine that. It's like having a large wave and it becoming a tsunami. I mean, you just mm -hmm. cannot imagine how fast, how big, how dramatically it changed my life. Uh, it went up online on a Wednesday. And on Friday, I was on the front page of the New York Times, and I got off a plane with my family. And my mother called and said, what have you done? <laughs> 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 but the reason I think it had such a tremendous resonance is the intergenerational issue. Yes. It's exactly the intergenerational issue. Now, I knew, because I wrote about that in the article, I say, you know, the woman of my generation says, you can't write this. You are betraying the cause. You're betraying mm -hmm. feminism. You're betraying everything that my generation and the, the unbelievable pioneers 10 years ahead of me worked for. But I knew because I said I went and talked to these young Rhodes Scholars who should have had the world at their feet, I knew that younger women were saying, there's something that's not adding up here. You know, this, it's not enough to say you can have it all. That is mm -hmm. just not working. We need to have this conversation again. And what I think drove this conversation was all the younger women Mm -hmm. um, who are almost uniformly positive. I have many women of my generation and older who are not positive, and it's, it's hard. It's hard. They're, they're my colleagues and friends, and I, but they see it as a very negative thing. Well, Uniformly well, younger yeah. women. Okay. Um, but those younger women marked up the article, sent it to their mothers, their sisters, their aunts, any older woman in their life, and said, see, it's not just me, <laughs> right? Anne Marie Slaughter says, and she's done this and that. And that, I think, it's that intergenerational conversation mm -hmm. where younger women were saying, this isn't working the way we expected to, and we need more, we need more and different, different answers. Mm -hmm. And what is harder and what is different, do you think, for women of a, of a, of a younger generation? Well, so it's interesting. The women of the younger generation have very different expectations, right? Because mm -hmm. they were raised after the, you know, the first flush of feminism. And, and I have to, for, for the younger women in the audience, you just have no idea how fast it changed, right? Because I came out of, co of college in 1980 and law school in 1985. I never had a woman law professor. And if I had a, and I did have women professors in college, but only in the humanities. Right. And when I was growing up, I did not know a single woman doctor, a single woman politician or engineer or anything. I knew one woman partner in my father's law firm. And that was like a really big deal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was still raised to believe, you, you know, you shouldn't be smarter than a guy. You shouldn't try to compete, all, the, all sorts of things. Um, that's not what my parents believed, but that was the culture. Uh, the, the younger women today were, re, were, believed, were raised to believe they could do anything, right? So by, the, by 10 years after I come out of college, I'm on the law teaching market in 1990. It's an advantage to be a woman, right? You have to meet the bar, but it's an advantage. They wanted to hire women. So we're, you, the, the change happened very quickly, and younger women really, I think, thought feminism was done. Right. <laughs> it's all done. It's fine. And then they hit you know, the, ch the, ch the caregiving years, and they discover, wait just a minute, this, this is not what I expected, this is really hard, I'm having to shoulder much more of this burden, um, that, you know, my husband is not deferring his career, mm -hmm. or just more generally, society yeah. is not set up to make this work. Yeah, um, I mean, how do you think that is between men and women now? I mean, the question of the relation of, uh, of work and life, I mean, th in many ways, the Let's talk about the work-life balance and how that is different for men and women. Well, because there's a, there's a you know, we, yeah, we, go ahead. The easy way to do it is announce a talk on work-life balance, because that's what I've spent the last almost two years now, a year and three quarters doing, and see how many men show up. <laughs> <laughs> sort of that simple. Now, more younger men are, and in the tech world, lots of younger men 
are, uh, which is really sort of interesting to see. It, it definitely varies by industry, and it is starting to vary. And at Yale Law School, which you would expect, it was 40% guys. I always, I always keep a, a tally. And at, at Harvard Business School, it, it was 15% guys, although I think many of them dragged there by their significant others, but nevertheless. Uh, but Go over, into the work-life balance talk. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, show that you are. But, but that's significant because women have more economic choices. And as we are, we're choosing men who are going to really be full partners. So that's actually very significant, even mm -hmm. if you're right. It's the, that guy now knows he'd better walk that talk or he's, he's going to have a, le you know, a less good chance uh, in the marriage market. Uh, but we're still, my starting answer is still the same. Talk about work-life balance, and it is still seen a women's issue. I say all the time that the other simple way you know this mm -hmm. is you know, if a woman comes into work and she's expecting, 10 people will ask her, you know, her mentors, her colleagues, her friends, how are you going to do it? How are you going to balance this? You're a lawyer, you're an investment banker, you're a doctor, you're an engineer. How are you going to do it? Do you know any guy who's been asked that question when he walks in and says, we're expecting a child? Has anybody ever said to him, how are you going to do it? My last year at Princeton, I started doing this routinely, and I do it everywhere now. Every time a guy comes to me and asks about his career, I've started saying, so have you thought about what you're going to do you know, when you, when you start thinking about starting a family? Have you thought about those years between 35 and 55 or whenever it might be? Mm -hmm. Have you thought about how to, cuss, how to plan your career to allow for your need to be at home more? And I do that with every single man I talk to, as I do with women. But until we're there, like everybody does that, we got a long be, way yeah, to go. Yeah, and there's an interesting phrase that you use in the article, which is um, time macho. Time macho, yes. Time macho. <laughs> and the idea that, I mean, I, no, I noticed that as someone that comes from, you know, what we laughably call Western Europe, and it, it's, you know, there is a different culture. It, laughably it, because it's Western? I'm just joking. <laughs> just, no, in the sense in which it's, um, oh, you know. Oh, the whole, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's still a tradition in, in England that you, you should work as little as possible if you possibly can. <laughs> and, and sort of skiving off and, and talking shit about the boss is, is fine and what you should, so there's, there's still elements of that kind of culture that's very resistant to work. And what I notice here is a very different work culture. It's extraordinary <laughs> and people, the place I work at, the new school, uh, people are there in a way that they weren't there at the university I was at previously. There's a kind of putting in the hours, yeah. Yeah. all that stuff. Now, this is the problem, right? This is a huge problem and how and I find that with the work hours of people in New York make family life kind of almost impossible. Yeah. Right? So how do we begin to change that? Because if you go somewhere like Norway, which is you know where you know, Ibsen, Doll's House, all of that, uh, things stop at four o'clock on the whole. Because at four o'clock you go home and you, you do your family time and you do that. Which means if you go to a, an event like this in in, in Oslo or in Bergen or something like that, it would be earlier in the day. <laughs> and, or it wouldn't be on a Saturday. It wouldn't be on a Saturday. It wouldn't yeah. be on a Saturday. And it would be, um, and most of the women in their 20s and 30s would have children, uh, or many more would have children and have children, say, in New York. And that's because of institutions, because of yeah. uh, publicly funded healthcare, so on and so forth. Now, so um, how do we change that culture of work? and in relation to the work-life work balance. Because it seems to me that what is also happening is something even more poisonous, which is the informalization of work. Yeah. We no longer know when we're working, when we're not working. Right. Am I working now? Right. You know, I'm, I'm, we're sort of working, but we're not working. Uh, you know, am I, when I'm doing email at home in, in the morning in my shorts, am I work, you know, whatever. And we just don't know where to yeah. draw the line. And you don't, we don't punch a card anymore, we don't, you know, it, we're constantly available, we're expected to be constantly available, so on and so forth. So this kind of informalization of work, which is one way of thinking about flexibility, means that we're never not working, right? right? And uh, we live this, right? But how, so how do, you, how do you see this culture of work issue? So I think the first thing to say is it has not always been so, mm -hmm. right? I mean, indeed, you were, when you were saying in England it's not okay, um, it's fine not to work, and you were saying to make fun of the bosses, I'm thinking Downton Abbey. I'm thinking, indeed, right. working 
was a, a sign, you, you, you know, you were in trade. The upper class, the whole badge of being upper class was that you didn't work, right. not that you worked round the clock. So mm -hmm. now, in the United States, the work week for paid workers, hourly workers, has dropped. Right, it's 35, not 40. And for many workers, the, the phenomenon known as disposable workers, it's, there's far too much flexibility, right? They get 10 hours one week and 15 the next. I mean, they don't actually have enough hours to earn a decent living. Uh, but at the top, of course, we work infinite, you know, we, as I write in the article, the, the, I remember, um, associates in the firm I worked at, where you could bill more than 24 hours in a day if you could be on a flight to China and get a second part of the day. Really? Right? I mean, really, this just total ridiculousness. But right. it hasn't always been true, and it wasn't always true even within my memory for the, again, the lawyers. When wow. I interviewed with New York law firm partners in the early 80s, law was still a partnership, it was still a profession. These were guys who, and they were mostly guys, uh, but who really thought of themselves as advisors. They had lives. It was not always at the office. And then mm -hmm. law became a business. Everything became a business. It was all about money. It was all about work. Uh, and we, you know, that's a, obviously I'm eliding a lot of factors, uh, but it has not always been so. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing uh, to recognize. This Absolutely is, I right. think, a particular disease partly technology fueled, partly globalization fueled, and partly money fueled, mm. uh, in my view. The backlash is almost here. It's almost here. It's okay. coming. And here are three examples. One is my email has started to drop off on weekends increasingly. Now, that may just be that I'm at New America and I make clear that, you know, I really believe in family-friendly work. And now when I write emails on weekends, I put them in the draft folder and I send them all out on Monday morning because I know I'm the boss, so everybody's gonna respond to me, and I don't want them to respond to me over the weekend, but if I don't send the email now, I'll never remember it. So we, that's how I do it. That's a small example. Here are two others. Uh, Bridget Schulte's book that just came out, it was a funded at New America, called Overwhelm. Overwhelmed is a bestseller instantly. It is all about, you know, we have just got to stop. That's this the feeling, is isn't it? Overwhelmed is the, that, that's the... Everybody, yeah. everybody is, yeah. it, but, but what it's doing to our health, what it's doing mm -hmm. to our productivity. The reason we have a 40-hour work week is Henry Ford and industrials like him figured out on the uh, available science of the day, after 40 hours, you become le less productive. Now, there's a big surprise. You know, after eight hours of doing the same thing, you do it less well than you did, you know, if you get some sleep uh, and some, some recreation. Uh, the other point being that we're moving into a knowledge economy where innovation and, and creativity are highly prized, and they do not, you cannot be creative if you do not have serious downtime. I mean, as a creative mm. person myself, I build in walks, I build in all sorts of things that, that, that are, are downtime. So that book was an instant bestseller. Mm -hmm. And Arianna Huffington, who has not been known for not working, um, <laughs> but her book called Thrive is about to come out. And it is nothing but the first part is about med meditating. The second part is about sleeping. Uh, you know, that's the, the pendulum is swinging because we have just gotten to the point where we can't function. And it is counterproductive. And it is unproductive. Yeah. So I... I I think we, you know, we need more than a few books, but I see these books and I see the way millennials work. That's the last thing I'll say about that. My assistant, who graduated in class at 12, routinely would leave the office before I did. And I, I mean, when she first did it, I thought, oh, really? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I, I should just say, I, I have a former assistant in the audience somewhere, and she never did. But, the, the <laughs> um, but this young woman, you know, plays rugby, has a life, thinks that's very important. She got her work done. I could never fault mm -hmm. her on getting her work done, but she thought she, you know, she'd worked enough, and she was always available by email, to your second point, so why mm -hmm. should she be in the office? Well, after about uh, six months of this, I thought, what's the matter with me? Like, why am I still at my desk? She's gotten her work done, and she's left. I must be the inefficient one, because I'm still sitting here. And I say that because I would never have left before my boss. Just unthinkable. You wouldn't do that. But that's a millennial mindset. Okay. That's very interesting. Um, and I hope the backlash is, um, yeah, on the way. That it's sounds, coming. That sounds great. It's coming. Uh, what Maybe about, not in New York. Yeah, that's right. Maybe a little while. <laughs> let, me, let me 
But let's think about that in relationship to politics and um, this thing that we call leadership. Hmm. And uh, there's a president of this country called Barack Obama who has a, a criticism that's made of him is that he has dinner with his wife and children. And um, you find this in different areas. You find it insinuated, insinuated in, in um, here and there. And it means that he's, well, he's not attentive to his job. He's not, he's not winning over members of Congress or senators. He's not doing what politicians should be doing, which is 24-7, you know, being a leader. And we, so there's this kind of, if there's, a, if there's a super time macho, it's the political leader. Yeah. So if we have a political culture, which is based on this idea of leadership, we're going to end up with a certain un understanding of gendered leadership. What do you think about that, that question? Is that, because um, the question you raise at the end of the article, which I'll just raise now because it's, it's a great question and it's kind of a, a teasing question. You say, um, we may need to put a woman in the White House before we're able to change the conditions of women working at Walmart. But when we do, we will stop talking about whether women can have it all. We'll probably focus on how much we can help all Americans have healthy, happy, productive lives, valuing the people that they love as much as a success they seek. So do you think there is a problem with that culture of line. leadership? It's a good line. It's good <laughs> stuff. Yeah. It's the long no, Yeah. And, and um, so what would that, how might that be changed? That, that, that where that time macho work culture is what we understand as our political culture. So the first thing to say, I think, is it's a legitimate debate as to what we would expect from a president. Because there are plenty of people who say, yeah, it's fine for him to have dinner with his family, but if that's what he wanted, he shouldn't have run for president. That, you know, being president, is a, you are inevitably always on. That's part of mm -hmm. the job. The world doesn't wait on you. Uh, when there are crises, when you are needed, you know, the fate of millions depends on you, m hundreds of millions. And so you can't expect to have a normal life. And I think there's something in that. Uh, and, you know, and it's often true that people run for president after, you know, their kids are grown. So they, they're not in that situation. I think it's a legitimate point of view. I don't agree, partly because I don't want everybody to have to wait till they've had kids to run for president. I want younger people to run for president. I want women to run for president. I want men and women uh, who have children and other caregiving responsibilities to be in the White House. I think actually in many ways uh, he reflects and understands more of what many of us are going through as continually engaged in his, his children's lives. So. I, I think that there is that. There's a way of also just basically saying he's been feminized, yes. right? He's not, you know, he's there with his kids. That's not a real man. And that goes mm -hmm. to all the, the things we've been talking about. Um, but I, I, think, I think that is right. Where I fault him is he's shown very little leadership on that issue in his own administration because he's having dinner with his kids, but nobody working for him is. I assure you, uh, at least in the foreign policy team, I don't know the domestic policy team, but the foreign policy team is there around the clock. And when you say things like, well, what about if they could get a skiff at home, meaning they could see classified documents at home? Or what about job shares, which really are essential? If you're going to be a woman on the National Security Council with kids, it's nearly impossible. I mean, you will not get home till you know, 11 o'clock most nights. And for a year, maybe your, your partner can take the kids. But... You know, you talk about job shares, no, we don't want to do that. So he's, he's shown precious little leadership on, all right, I'm going to make my White House a White House where people can actually see their, their children. And yes, they're intense jobs, but mm -hmm. there are ways, ways to do it. Um, but still, I, I, I applaud him for being the dad that he is. The issue about having a woman president is that I do believe more women in politics will make it more legitimate to focus on quote unquote women's issues. And I think you're seeing that already with 20 women in the Senate, lo and behold, we're looking at family leave again, hallelujah. You know, in 1971, we were talking about nationally subsidized daycare or mm -hmm. in the early 70s, right? That's suddenly become completely taboo. Why? I have no idea. You know, a majority of working parents would support it, but nobody puts it on the, on the agenda. So, where I do think that having more women in politics, and you need a critical mass to say, 
wait a minute, we need to build what I call an infrastructure of care, which would be you know, affordable, high quality daycare, early education that really starts uh, at age three, goes through eight, after school care, uh, elder care, all the, the way, and, and not just institutionalized care, but you know, let's try valuing care done in the home as part of our GNP or our GDP. Let's try giving caregivers social security because they're doing essential work, all those things. Uh, are, are very important. And I do think uh, that it's not only women who think about them, but more women think about those issues than men do. Yeah. And, and having a woman president, I think, would legitimate a lot of that. Although the first woman president, like the first woman ever, anything, will be, she's not, that's not going to be the, her first initiatives, right? She will, she'll have to prove she can be a guy first, and then she'll, she'll, she'll be free to be who she is. So as someone that works in the administration, who's going to be them? <laughs> <laughs> there was that Times any, article any, on all the ways you ask Hillary Clinton without asking <laughs> Hillary Clinton. You know? <laughs> um, you know, I sure hope she runs. Yeah. Well, we'll find out Although soon. I would just say on the woman front, I think it's equally likely that Republicans will have both run and elect a woman. I mean, it, it, I don't think the Democrats should assume they own that space by any means. Michelle Bachman. Be just great. There are lots of uh, Republican women who are very powerful and making a real difference. Uh, you know, <laughs> New Hampshire. New Hampshire has an all-women uh, uh, political group. All their co members of Congress and both their senators are women. New Hampshire, remember, live free or die. That's not Vermont. That's New Hampshire, and that's where you've got more women politicians. I want to open it up to the audience in a bit, and I'm um, sure there's lots of questions out there. But there's a you, you talk in, in the article again about the need for, maybe there's two things here, a national happiness project. <laughs> well, a national happiness that's project. That's Gretchen Rubin who does that, but yeah. Yeah, and uh, let us rediscover the pursuit of happiness yep. and let us start at home. Yep. And um, what, say some more about that. And also we were talking downstairs before we came in about the, um, the ways in which you think that masculinity is Masculinity, in a sense, is, is called into question. This is a discussion about feminism, truth and lies, but this is also has to be a conversation about masculinity and what that might mean. So you can answer either of those. You can forget about the happiness and just do the masculinity. <laughs> or the, way. Well, the happiness project one, I think, is, is part of the earlier piece of the backlash. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the idea that uh, you know, Arianna Huffington, again, has done the third metric that we should be measuring our lives and our, our success or achievement, or whatever word you want, in terms of what makes us fulfilled. Uh, and the answer to that is rarely just another rung on the career ladder or more, more money or more power. It is, it is the sum total of our relationships as human beings uh, and, and, and our appreciation of beauty. And you know, I get more pleasure watching my birds in the bird feeder every morning than through countless things I do later in the day. I'm going to make time to do that, or my first mm -hmm. cup of coffee, or you know, the site of the Princeton campus, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world. So I think that, again, is just, that's just the pendulum sw swinging back, and we, mm -hmm. we do need it. We've gotten way, way, way out of whack. Um, men and masculinity. Yeah. So this is a new book, right? This is, this is what I'm writing about in my book, yeah. uh, and is the sister of two brothers and the mother of two sons, particularly as the mother of two sons, I think about this a lot. Um, and this goes exactly to truth and lies because as feminist women, we want to be equal. But if you say to us, yeah, but you know what? Male CEOs have full-time caregivers at home. Find me a male CEO who has a family who has a wife or a partner who is not the lead caregiver. I defy you to find me that person. So then you say to the same women, so if we want to be CEOs, yes, we're superhuman and all that stuff, but you know what? Actually, you can't really expect us to do 24-7 jobs any differently than the guys do. So if we're going to be there and we're going to be in those top positions, we need a lead caregiver at home, as I have. My husband obviously has a full-time job, that's great, but he's the lead parent because I could not be the lead breadwinner if he were not the lead parent. I simply couldn't. Somebody's got to be home. I mean, even at 15 and 7, actually, 
particularly at 15 and 17. Somebody has to be home. Yeah, right. uh, as we discovered, yeah. we saw the doll's house last night. We came home. Our 15-year-olds had been home alone. Somebody ought to be home. <laughs> so... The place was trash. A bit. <laughs> Pizza boxes, we, we won't go there. Uh, but so, but with, so then you say, okay, so you want to be the CEO or the president of the university or the surgeon or the scientist, whatever. You've got to marry somebody who is willing to support you in the, in the homework, the family work, in the way he's gonna support you, believe me. You're not gonna be able to do what you wanna do without him, but that's probably what you're gonna have to do. And maybe you'll trade off, but he's gonna have to do that part of the time. And at that point, many women get off the bus. They don't wanna marry a guy like that. They don't think a guy like that is masculine. Indeed, the guys who do that, I know I'm in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn is the home of, you know, Brooklyn gives the lie to all this. There are more stay-at-home uh, dads here than probably anywhere else uh, in the US, uh, or work-from-home dads, or, or lead caregiver dads, or however you wanna put it. But in most places in the US, those dads report that the women they engage with on the, uh, you know, on the playground think they're a little odd. Do not think of them as a model of masculinity. We can't have it both ways, right? Just as right, right. I was told growing up, you know, <clears throat> don't, be, don't be too smart. You know, you don't, uh, don't be too smart around a guy. He won't want you. Well, right, that, that vision of femininity had to change. It had to change. Guys had to think that women who were powerful and smart and competitive were attractive, because otherwise we couldn't do it. Well, you know what? We have to think that a guy who puts his family first, that a guy who says, no, you know, I want to be the lead parent. You know, I'm going to defer a promotion. I'm not going to be the most powerful guy out there. We have to say, you are a masculine, valued, wonderful man. And if we can't get there, we are not going to make this kind of change. Because we've gotten as far as we can get without doing that. We've got 15% of unbelievable super women who get really lucky, right? Or who have a lot of money, uh, or who are just really superhuman, who manage to make it work. But we're not going to get further than that. So it's really about changing the way we think about it. It's not only, but a lot of it is about changing how we think about men and what we think a masculine, attractive guy is. That's the question for the coming generation, as it were. Yep. That's, that's going. To, okay, that's a per, that's a great point to open it up. So let's let's move to questions, and I'll I can see the house lights are a bit extreme, but I can see some hands going up already. Let's start over there, please. Thank you. I think you've been given the mic anyway, so. <laughs> Good. You can you speak. <laughs> Um, very, very interesting set of conversations and lots to think about. Um, I just wanted to raise, you brought up class and you brought up generation. Yeah. And Simon kind of touched on the, the um, kind of Europe versus America and I'm also English. Um, it strikes me that there's something very American about the concept of having it all. Um, I mean, I, as, as a woman with a very inspiring feminist mother, I don't think I ever thought I was going to have it all. And I'm just wondering if some of... Um, what you're talking about in terms of backlash or overwhelmed is also maybe to do with America's changing role in the world. And you, oh. I mean, your real expertise is on foreign policy. Well, <laughs> real expertise, that's wrong. I mean, but you are known as a no, foreign I'm, policy scholar. You're and quite maybe, right. My real expertise <laughs> is on foreign, foreign policy. The rest and that's of how I knew <laughs> you originally was uh, as no. um, someone with expertise in foreign policy. But also what you might think about other kinds of feminisms, like in India, where the, the role of women is changing phenomenally, and how maybe the concept of having it all and, and different national cultures and their role in the world maybe is something to think about too. What an interesting question. Mm. So the first thing to answer with you is just the, my love-hate relationship with having it all. Right? I, I did not choose the title. I, I did, actually, but, but what I wanted to say was, um, something like, you know, why women still can't, why women can't have it all, dot, 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 yet. Because I wanted mm -hmm. to make the point that this is really about the next generation of changes that have to happen uh, for us to get there. 
And having it all only meant to me having a career and a family too. It did not mean having everything you want. I don't want everything I want. I'm a person who prefers to want it than to have it. It's a, uh, and that, but that goes directly to your second point. So then, you know, Rebecca Tracer and others said you, you bought into the backlash, you bought into to painting women who wanted careers and families as being piggish and selfish and having it all, and that's terrible. And then I said, okay, we're not, I'm never going to use this phrase again. I hate it. And then people came back and said, but wait a minute, there's nothing wrong with wanting, with striving. And Andy Cohen said, you know, God bless women. They still believe they can, they can get there. And so that it is, I think, a very American thing, but I'm not sure we can read it out of our culture, and I'm not sure we should. Because as much as I love the European way of living and, the, and lots and lots of things I love about it, I'm not a European. I work too hard. I want things more. You know, I, I do. I want to work lazy. less. You're lazy. Lazy English person. No, no, no. But it, and the point being, it's really tricky because it is sort of in our DNA. And it, it is. It's it consistent is, yeah. with much less, much more recreation than we have now. But, but I... I think that is right, that some of this, some of the angst around this is, are we still that, is that really still us as a nation? And part of the reason we can't, we don't want to adopt, you know, paid family leave and va decent vacations and all of that is a fear that somehow we are feminized as a nation. And I don't believe that, but it's a complicated uh, debate. It is a complicated debate. Um, let's go here next. So, there, and then that will go to the other side. Please. If I don't see your hand, it's because um, it's really, you don't see it, but we're kind of blinded by the lights down here, so it's hard to see. So, go I'm, I'm going to betray some of the uh, ob obtruseness that you referenced at the beginning, uh, and sort of ignorance and whatever else, but I think your <laughs> article two, two and a half years ago, for me, was the first time that I started having these conversations with anyone, wow. with my sister, with my mother, with my, with, with my friends. And it, 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 two things that you said struck me that um, so many young women marked up your article and sent it, as you said, to their mothers and their aunts and their sisters. Um, and that all the books that are coming out and have come out were by women. And it, and it seems to me that, uh, so I sort of am mostly ignorant about feminism and, and whatever else, but sort of have read a little bit and sort of, have only limited understanding of you know first wave, second wave, yeah. third wave. It's complicated. And, yeah, and, and, and I'm sure I'm, I lose Small all the waves. nuance. But it seems to me that rather than these conversations being had just amongst women, it seems like there'd be a lot of value if fathers were having them with sons for the first time, right? Forget the seventh wave, the first wave yeah. amongst men. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the reaction that men had to your article and, and sort of what conversations you've had with men. It seems like if you're gonna change institutional and sort of cultural norms that are still sort of so male dominated, unfortunately, it seems like that half of the population needs to be a little bit more involved. Yep, absolutely. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, and uh, I, did, I did hear from many more men than I expected to hear from. And as I said, in the tech world, which is interesting, many more guys come up and thank me for the article. Not Most guys came up and would say, my wife gave me this article. Most would say it in a tone that then said, and then we had one hell of a fight and I don't like you at all. <laughs> that was the sort of subtext, was like, you know, we opened these uh, the issues up and, and it wasn't fun. Uh, but, but a lot of younger guys in tech particularly said, yeah, I'm thinking about these issues too and this is important. And, uh, but the more general point is exactly right. I mean, the theme of my book, one of the themes of my book is the second half of the women's movement has to be a men's movement, or the fifth wave, if we want a fourth wave. I never can remember what wave we're supposedly on. Uh, but but uh, it does have to be a men's movement. It fundamentally has to be a human movement. But we're not going to have that unless men are fully fully, fully part of it. Uh, and so we gotta change the vocabulary, we gotta change the frame, we've gotta make it possible for men to say, hang on, you know, I care every bit as much about my family, you know, I'm trapped in this system too, it's not like I want to work all these hours and not be there for my kids or my parents or my siblings or my dog, right? My, you know, the, the, the sort of sense of that part of me as a man is, 
uh, just as, as, as much there, but it's been suppressed and socialized mm -hmm. out of me. Yeah. Um, guys have got to be able to say that too. And, uh, you know, I would like to see us, you know, for all that we celebrate Angelina Jolie for all the work she does, and that's great and she's fabulous, I want to say, what about Brad Pitt going around with six kids? Right? But, but quite seriously, right? It, the fact that he's willing, as a, a male role model, as a movie star, to be there with six kids hanging all over him, you know, doing that, I want to see much more of saying, that man, that man is a great man. And, you know, he works too. I mean, again, all human beings have both of these. But I think without men in this conversation, we're not going to make that kind of change. So thank you. Actually, Brad Pitt's in the audience. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Not Brad, you know, Brad Pitt's doing okay. He probably doesn't Does need. Uh... Glasses. <laughs> the the light. It played a trick on my eyes. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Maybe, maybe now you can recognize. Um, <laughs> no, just getting back to some things you were saying about the play, um, and there was a point you made, and I, I guess I'm referenced because I recently saw I saw it here, and I saw another version oh. of Enemy of the People. Is that there's the contrast between? You um, saw the Ostermeyer production here, did you? Did yeah. You? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they also had another version of it at Under the Radar Festival. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a conflict that's, that's very clear in Enemy of the People between public um, opinion and private morality. Yep. And you alluded that a little. I haven't seen this play in a long time, but you alluded to some of that in this play as well. You know, between Torvald, sort of, he, he wants her to do the honorable thing, but they're more concerned with how the public sees them. And I guess maybe there's a strain of that with Nora as well in that the conflict is that women in that society are sort of based on, on a public level, their identity is based on pleasing the other, pleasing the male, being, you know, and, and she goes to private morality by, you know, asserting herself in the way she does. And I just was wondering if, if, if you could address that a bit or if there's any oh, kind of... for anne -Marie or for me? Both, either, <laughs> whoever wants to answer okay, it, well, I'm, it's, I'm open. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting. The, the, um, one of the things I like about Ibsen's men is that they're, they're sort of useless. <laughs> they're, sort of, they're sort of these ineffectual beings who cling to public status. Enemy of the People's a bit different, to say the least. And there are plays like Brand, where you've got this much very different male figure, sort of titanic, self-destructive, like a, like a Herzog, then a Herzog hero. But it's these late figures like Hedda Gabler, Hilda Wengel in Master Builder, um, and these and uh, the, these sort of ti titanic female figures who are full of this complexity. And, and Ibsen's drawing them from from Euripides and from uh, certain Greek models. It, it fascinates me, and um, it's you know it, it's about a demand for love at some level. So, you know, when, when Torvald says in this play, you know, nobody honors, um, no man sacrifices, sacrifices honor, honor for, for the, the one he loves. Yeah. I mean, then you ask, well, what is honor? Honor is, as Falstaff says in, you know, Henry IV, it, it's a word. It's, it's, it's a bubble. It's nothing. It's a pointless term. People that value their honor, in a sense, are missing the point, and I believe that profoundly. And what Nora wants is, is love, and that's something much more, much more difficult. So part of the, the, for me, part of what the play is about is breaking Torvald, breaking apart that male culture in the name of love. That's kind of the way I read Ibsen. <sighs> the, it, as you were, so it's, it, it, you know, and this is big guy with the beard in Norway in the 19th century and all of that. But there's a source of a strange identification that Ibsen had with these these, uh, these female characters, and they were going to break apart uh, the social order that, um, of his time. And then, of course, the other the kind of way to continue that through, which is really strange, is that the um, I mean, one answer to your question in the Atlantic piece about what might our society look like, and I said, well, it might look like Norway. And so then when you have, I spent a lot of time in Norway and Sweden, and you, know, you look at, as it were, the most the best versions, of so, best versions of social democracy that we have, and the achievements are considerable. But they throw up different forms of disaffection, different forms of radicalization, xenophobia, Anders Breivik, <laughs> uh, a kind of uh, 
you know, it, so it, it's not as if that's uh, going to be the solution to all of our problems. And um, that isn't really an answer to the question. But well, no, so I, it's interesting. I, 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 when you say that, that it's about breaking Torwald, yeah, Torvald breaking him and, apart. and because she seeks love. Again, my sense of what she meant by love, that that notion that what she wanted was him to first save her and then she'd save him. I, I thought it, that's not my vision of, of, mm -hmm. of genuine love. But what I, the way I saw it, which is not, which goes with your point about breaking, is that he's caged as much by the weight of public expectation as she is by her private role, right? That he, he is terrified at the idea that his honor will be sullied mm -hmm. because that's who he is as a man. That's what defines him as a man. And right. so he, that, that's part of what I was saying before. We have to break down, we have to break out of those cages in not just around women, but also around what we, we, expect, we expect from men. Absolutely. The yeah. other thing just, to, you know, it's interesting is the, the most selfless person in the play is a man, and it's Dr. Raka, who you know has this disease. Who Rank, yeah. Raka, yeah, uh, and who when he realizes he's dying doesn't want to burden his friends, and so just puts the two business cards, his calling cards, with a black X to say I'm going off. And he really he loves her. He accepts that she doesn't love him. He doesn't make a scene. He is the traditional selfless woman. He's the, you know, he plays the role that mm -hmm. we assign to women that she rejects uh, and that Torvald doesn't have, but he's a man. Who's next? Let's go right to the back in the middle there. And then right at the back over there was a question. Okay, let's, do, let's go to the back of the room. Go ahead. Um, so first of all, thank you for your article in The Atlantic and thank you for doing this talk. Um, one thing that you said today was that part of, part of what we need to do is, is reorient our conversation about, how, about our notions of, of women and, and men and the work-life balance. Um, but one, one thing that I was thinking about and, and a factor that comes into play is, is the word feminism and how it's such a polarizing word um, and, and we've said it a lot today. You know, do you think that we need a different word? Do you think that we need to uh, put forth a different understanding of that word? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, thank you. And again, it's changed. We were talking about this downstairs. That mm -hmm. for me, of course I was a feminist. Every, every, you know, if you were a woman and you wanted a career, you were a feminist, full stop. But Seven years later, Deborah Sparr's new book, The President of Barnard, and her book is Wonder Women, Sex, Power, and I can't remember the last line, but at any rate, about her experiences, she comes on exactly seven years after me, and feminism is a dirty word. So that's the difference between 80 and 87. And then, of course, Sheryl Sandberg writes about that, too. And for Sheryl, it's a brave thing to say, I am a feminist. So... Um, I've thought a lot about this. You know, the men I knew who advanced my career were proud feminists. Guys said, you know, I'm a feminist, and, the, and they really meant that they wanted to advance the cause of women's equality. Uh, and in some ways, I think, well, you know, we just can't abandon it. We should just reclaim it and reclaim it sort of more broadly, and what does it mean for men to be feminists? Uh, but I've also thought about, you know, a, a kind of a new humanism and thinking about, and that goes very much to also the broader spectrum of human values mm -hmm. and valuing things other than work. That gets into a whole set of arguments about what humanism has meant traditionally and secular humanism and whether or not there's a whole religious dimension. And so I, I really have wrestled with it. I think... I prefer the women's movement the, uh, the, and a, a movement for equality, uh, just generally. I think that's where we really want to talk about it, is what does real equality mean? And the other way, and this gets back to the frame, I said I'm looking for a frame that unifies the experience of low-income women and high-income women. I like to think of it as all humans have a caring side and a competitive side, 
and that, that really what we're looking for is a balance between care and competition uh, across our society and that we need to rebalance in favor of a whole set of values that are closer maybe to the work that mom once did rather than the work that dad once did and the early feminist movement, you know, what dad did was important and what mom did wasn't. But instead, we should actually value all those, those kinds of work. And maybe we don't need the label for that. I think it was at the back, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd be very oh, interested to... Oh, there's one, actually, yeah, go ahead and then the person behind oh, you can sorry. ask the next question. That's okay. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear your views on quotas um, and how effective are they, in your view, um, for achieving gender parity as a top-down approach. And I think you alluded to it earlier on that you know there, there needs to be a cultural transformation, a bottom-up approach as well. So just interested to hear your views on the effectiveness of quotas. Thanks. Uh -huh. Look, at the outset, uh, Quotas itself are, is a dirty word in American politics, but affirmative action for women, for minorities, for it was in a, a kind of quotas in the sense it really said you must break the mold, right? You must have more women, you must have more minorities, you have to put a thumb on the scale. Uh, and I actually think that has been pretty indispensable uh, to getting any uh, of a disadvantaged group uh, the, the first leg up. Uh, I would, honestly, if I could, I think probably quotas uh, in the political system, as in France, uh, how many women you have to have, would go, it's a very fast way to make change, and particularly where mm -hmm. you need a critical mass, it can be very effective. Uh, I can see the same thing with boards, because it's so hard to break, right? I mean, it's just, you know, people choose people who look like themselves, and so you're just constantly, uh, getting there. So I am not opposed uh, in, in the way many people are. As an American in American politics, I don't think that's the way to go. I think you're going to have a fight over that much more than you are over the underlying issues. So I wouldn't push it uh, in American politics because I don't think we're going to get there. But in European politics uh, and in other countries, I wouldn't for a minute condemn it because uh, I do think it can really make change very fast. Uh, it, it's a transitional measure, however, right? Because anybody who know anybody, a woman like me who had, was advantaged by affirmative action, anybody who's been advantaged by affirmative action, the first thing you want to do is prove that you got there because you are who you are, not because of your skin color or your gender. So it's got to be handled very carefully. But sometimes you need to to break that glass ceiling with one big hammer. But is there a kind of because I mean, you say in your article that the uh, a number of prominent women including yourself, who were appointed to the Obama administration, served for two years and left and were all replaced by men. Yep. So is, the, is, the, is, the, is it that uh, quotas or affirmative action are important as a transitional thing, or is it something that needs to be continually done? In the sense in which, I mean, in my little corner of the woods, you know, in, in, in philosophy, you know, which is a you know, strange... It's a very male field. Very male field, very male field. And so what we have to do is... We, we kind of engage in a deception where we, 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 we can't say we're going to appoint a woman or we want female graduate students, but we, that's what we do. We, yeah. we, 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 because we know if we don't do that, we'll end up with a class that's 90% yeah. men, 10% yeah. women. And so you have to, and, and you have to continually do you that. You have to constantly do that. And if you don't do it for a year or two, right. you, yeah. So it's not, <laughs> so the transitional thing is, yeah. is tricky, I think. Yeah. But I don't know. There was, I think behind I'm the question, there was another question. Hi. Um, Hi. I can, I, <laughs> um, I completely agree with what you're saying in terms of reimagining masculinity, but I'm also wondering about the flip side of that in terms of the idea of women as a as the primary earner. Because I think we're very comfortable with the idea of women working, but we're not that comfortable with the idea of w women, frankly, being interested in money and also being the primary breadwinner. Because I, 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 I see that we still focus, the idea that, oh, you should have a fulfilling career as opposed to you should have a career where you make money. That we, I think with women, we, we still push them towards careers that, with, with this idea, well, you'll always have someone else to make more money for you. And I'm just wondering what we can also do to kind of deal with that. I'm smiling only because uh, 
you know, even though I always thought I'd have a career, there was never any question I'd have a career. It wasn't until I was 30 and my first marriage had ended that it dawned on me I might actually have to like provide a pension for myself, right? At the back of my mind was very definitely somebody else is going to be earning an income too. And, and it, it never occurred to me that I'd be the primary breadwinner, much less the only breadwinner. So I definitely, I think that is very deeply ingrained, not, not surprisingly. There is a class dimension to that, right? I mean, in, mm -hmm. the, in middle income groups, if you read the richer sex, you will see, and largely because of the number of the jobs that have disappeared for men, women are out earning men. Now, the 40% of American women are the breadwinner, that's very misleading, because that's, that's including all the single mothers. So you have to take out all the single mothers and you'll actually see that's middle income at the top, very rare. We know relatively, I mean, if, you just, if I think about all the women, you know, who come out of business school who, or law school or wherever who should be out earning their husbands, it's, it's still very few. But first thing to say is that's a class issue. But you're right. This, but to me, this goes back to masculinity again. I mean, it's like when I would say, well, I out earn my husband, Lots of people, lots of women, not just men, were like, you don't say that. You're emasculating him. I mean, really, let's, be, right. let's really right. be honest about this. There's a kind of, you don't want to earn more money than he does because his masculinity is tied up in, in that, and you don't want to admit it. And that's where I, again, think you really have to break this open and say, wait a minute, that can't be right. You know, I was Sarah Blakely, the head of Spanx, right, who's a billionaire, stands up in front of Women in the World, the summit, and says her first two marriages, her first two relationships break up because she earns so much money. And on, the, on her husband, she actually didn't, was scared to tell him, you know, that she was a billionaire. Now, my teenage sons, when I told them this story, said, are they crazy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, are they crazy? And that, but that's where we have to get that. It, yeah, just like if a woman made a good marriage, right? She married a good provider. A man should be able to make a good marriage where you know you you whoever makes the income, that's a good marriage. You've got you've got the wherewithal to do what you want. But th that gets at a lot of deeply entrenched stereotypes that we women hold just as much as men do. Where should we go to next? Um, I'd like to come down the front, if we could. And then over there, this goes next. Over there would be great. Hi. Uh, do you think there's any part of the scenario that has to do with a higher bar that we've set for parenting itself? Yes. <laughs> and just, the a, just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> That you know, uh, the helicopter parent yeah. and kids have to be taking Mandarin when they're one years old, and <laughs> we got to all be a tiger parent. And what about? Isn't that all tied to the economic uh, battle that we're in in the world? So that that is such a great point, and it's yeah. it's unquestionably true, right? Just as women hit the workforce, guess what? Parenting is a full time job too, right? And whereas it definitely was not. I mean, yes, you. You were there for your kids, but this notion that you should be enriching them every minute of every day was 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 crazy. And Bridget Schulte again, a read overwhelmed. She's just she's marvelous uh, on this point. Uh, so, I mean, first place I'll just say I am I am not a tiger parent. I'm we routinely tell our kids we are loser parents, which means you know we have yet again forgotten that something is happening and that we should have done this and we should have been there for that and you know, whatever. Um, and I actually honestly do, maybe I'm making a virtue of necessity, but I, I think letting kids do a lot on their own breeds self-reliance, and I believe that they, if they're not going to have downtime as teenagers, God help them, right? And my, you know, they're gonna, they'll never have time to ha just hang out again. Uh, but I think, I think there are two things going on, and again, I don't know, that I haven't done, seen the social science. One is unquestionably a lot of women who are very highly educated who did step out and who got all that, you know, career focus, whatever, and it go, all gets poured into their kids. The one year I took a sabbatical, my kids were like, would you please go back to work? You know, just get, <laughs> get out of our hair. The, the, uh, but, but the other, yeah. th there is an economic competition going. So my husband, and we disagree about this a lot, would say, you're just, you're just fooling yourself. This is the strategy to get your kid to where your kid needs to be in an infinitely more competitive setting. 
And he's right if I look at, you know, what, what standards for, you know, admission to good colleges are. Yes, they speak Mandarin and they play violin with their toes while they're, you know, setting up an NGO and have a 4.0 average and 17 APs. And yeah, well, that's not my kid. That would take a full-time job and a lot of genetic manipulation. <laughs> but so yeah, but I so I think it is it is the both the both factors. Um, but frankly, that, that's not what I want, you know. Either I'm not sure. I don't think it's healthy at all. No, that's a good point. Um, over there, the, yes, exactly, and then and then behind. Hi. Hello. So I'm wondering about um, what you touched on a little bit earlier when you're talking about uh, attractiveness of men. I'm interested in what, how you think sexual chemistry plays into feminism. Uh, I know there was a, there was well, an article in question. I think the New York Times Magazine about how gender roles are sort of decreasing sexual chemistry. Yes, yes. And that was I mean, even in the Doll's House, Nora's actions are very feminist, but there's a way in which she's kept very feminine. Yes. And hence your comment about loving women like that. So yeah. that, as a young woman, feels like a really complicated. That sort of feels like the next complicated question for me that I'm negotiating, and I feel like a lot of my female friends are negotiating. So, so say, say just a little more. That, that, <clears throat> in other words, how feminine do you have to be to... Yeah, as a, as a woman, I mean, I'm also very tall, and as a woman who's, like, trying to take up space in the world and in my career and in, you know, yeah. in life, negotiating the ways in which sexual chemistry is sort of at odds with yep. that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, That's good. It's a great... It's great. And Please, my husband and I both read that and, and we're very interested in it. And actually, since you said you're tall, a man said to me recently, I never noticed so many tall women before. And I said, yeah, one reason was they were all taught to slouch. Right? I mean, the tall women are much more comfortable being tall because they, they've actually been encouraged. Uh, whereas certainly, you know, when I was growing up, a tall woman never wore heels. God forbid you should be taller than a guy. You know that so anyway, but but more broadly, this is this is really complicated. I mean, what that article basically said is, as men and women become more similar, mm -hmm. the sexual chemistry diminishes because we are hardwired to like difference, which for many reasons you can see is good for the gene pool, right? We we know that, and so that what's happening is it's less about, you know that that he's a guy or you're a woman it, so much as if you're playing one role and, he, and he's completely different, so you're all feminine and he's all masculine in our traditional stereotypes, there's more chemistry there. That should be true, the flip, right? That if you're all breadwinner and he's all caregiver, uh, that should be true. I, she did, we didn't, there weren't examples of that. And this is where, again, I, I go back to you know, so how do we think about what is attractive in a man? How much, what, how much is socialized? And what do we think is attractive in a woman? All I can say is I think that's in flux. Um, I again think, though, you, you have to let... We just, we just, we need the equivalent of all the role models that we've seen, like in Hollywood, where where you could, where you change the cultural iconography of what is attractive around a woman who can bring home the bacon. It used to be, you know, you bring it home and you fry it up. There's this Enjo Lee commercial from the 1970s where you know she she brings home the bacon and she fries it up in a pan and then blah, 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 and she can still, you know, I can still be, you can still be my man. I mean, the whole sort of doing it all as opposed to sort of letting us all do different combinations. But I think, I think it's in flux and I think it's still very hard. And I think about the, the rise of the interest in vampire fiction. <laughs> in the sense in which, you know, series like True Blood you know, it's all premised upon the only good man is a right. dead man. Right. Right. Right? It's, only, it, it's, only, it's only a vampire that can really desire you, you know, right. because right. his desire is, he loves, he really loves Suki and, you know, and they're <laughs> fantastically sexually potent as well. So you get, yeah, so I think, I think it's a real question. And the flip side of that would be the zombie. The <laughs> zombie is kind of, anyway. So there's, there's one more question, though, because it's very important. I mean, I... I think it's important for every woman in the audience to ask, you know, would you marry down? 
right? That's part of what that article is about. Like, would you marry somebody who has less education than you do, who maybe, you know, works at a manual trade uh, in some way, in the same way we were talking before. It's okay mm -hmm. for the, for, for a, traditionally it was fine for a man to marry a secretary, but it's certainly not, it was not okay for a woman to marry her secretary, assuming she has a male, male secretary or a female secretary. Uh, so I think, but there again, right, if we really want to expand that pool, then we have to think hard about, well, why not, right? Why do we have to assume that the guy we marry has to have more education or equal education or more income or equal income? Why not be able to marry some guy who's going to be just a great guy? I'm going to take two questions um, together. The gentleman at the front there. and Let's take those three together, and then, we can yeah, just, okay. then we'll finish and round that out. So first one was there. There was a, someone at the front. Who had their hand up down here? Oh, there? Mm -hmm. And then the gentleman here. Okay. Hi. Thank you for being here. Uh, just to bring a different cultural... Oh, uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> just to bring different cultural perspective to the conversation here. I come from Saudi Arabia, and uh, I think the media here has a lot of uh, misleading information about women's situation in Saudi Arabia, and I think it is kind of exaggeration because... I, from, as an insider, I feel like many women are happy with the situation there because actually this, how the society, the society built, uh, women are, I, I mean men are, has, ob, have oblig, obligation to satisfy any financial or even social needs for uh, women. So uh, it seems like strange that uh, even for example, my wife, when I, Always, I encourage her to go and work. She said, "No, it's just I am happy to be, you know, a <laughs> caregiver and uh, to care, to care, take care of children." So, uh, what do you think of that? I guess the first point and the second point is down here, the front row. Could we get the mic down there? Or we could, oh, okay. And then here last. Hi. Please. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, my, my, my point is actually not much of a question, but perhaps I, I would like to add something to the conversation that was happening before about the chemistry, okay, and something about the hard wiring. But uh, hard wiring and these natural tendencies are actually wrong metaphors. Yeah, that's good. Right, so uh, what we call uh, nature is nurtured all the time. This is how it works. So there is uh, some, we cannot talk about uh, these natural uh, tendencies uh, to find something attractive without taking into consideration uh, the social context uh, in which uh, we Absolutely grew up, right. in which yes. we develop. In the 17th century, uh, men wore uh, wigs. Yep. That was found attractive. They were mm -hmm. pink. They, they wore makeup. That was attractive. Exactly. So this is actually... Uh, yes. so, uh, I, I don't know if I can say an advice to you. I think you have to break, if you really want to change the, we want to change the concept of masculinity, we have to break it down, uh, yeah. we have to yeah. break through these uh, stereotypical qualities as nature determined. Um, I think but, this is a misconception. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. And the last point is here. Yes. Wait for the mic, because so we're live streaming to. I'm glad that my question is going to be the last one because it does trivialize uh, a discussion that has been very high-minded. <laughs> but uh, 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 one could conclude from something that you said that if Obama were presiding over a, a national security meeting uh, during which uh, uh, discussions about the life and death of uh, uh, thousands of people uh, uh, were being discussed and, uh, and uh, whether to drop bombs on uh, enemies, uh, whether perceived or, or real. Uh, and uh, so it, it, I would say from what you have said that uh, if six o'clock arrived and, uh, and uh, he said, well, sorry, the hell with the world, I'm going to go home because under the aspect of eternity, at least for me, it's much more important that I have uh, uh, dinner with my family rather than uh, discuss uh, matters that uh, really are important to humanity at large. Now, is, uh, is that what he would do? For instance, uh, on days that he has a, a state uh, dinner, that he would go first go home and have dinner with his family and have a second dinner with the head of state? Okay. How many dinners is he having? 
Well, it's got Saudi Arabia, nature, nurture, okay. and All right. the president's uh, dining habits. So, so let, me, let me do it this way. I'll, I'll start with the uh, Saudi Arabia. So this is tricky ground. Uh, I think it is certainly uh, possible that many women in Saudi Arabia are far happier than uh, the media portrays. I think without question. Uh, I think, though, that was also true of many women in the United States uh, before the women's movement uh, took place, in part because that was all that women had known. Uh, and that it, uh, you know, in the first place, part of what I'm arguing is that caregiving is just as important as breadwinning, and there's absolutely nothing wrong in saying this gives me great value, you know, and, and uh, this is a meaningful, important activity to be engaged in, and I'm empowering others, and that's a wonderful thing. That's fine, and there's nothing wrong with, with embracing that. I would also say that women who have a taste of what it is like to be able to develop yourself fully to your full potential, not only as a carer, but also as an independent agent. Uh, I would say the vast majority like some combination of both. That, uh, you know, once you realize what it's like to be a mother, a daughter, a sister, a wife, but also a writer, a thinker, a lawyer, a deal maker. Boy, there are two halves of our nature, accepting your, your point. But, but that the, these are, so I think there's still uh, a, a, a lot of consciousness raising for many, many, many Saudi women. Uh, what I would say is I think uh, th there are lots of caricatures and there are um, lots of Saudi men who feel very differently than the way Saudi men are, are portrayed. Uh, but, but I think we're going to see a lot of pretty dramatic changes as we move into an online world. Uh, then let me come to the president's dining habits. So look, um, there's no question, obviously, if there's a crisis, there's a crisis. I, 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 I did not vote for a president who's going to eat dinner rather than dealing with Ukraine or, or any, anything else. Uh, but, you know, even in a world of crisis, it is still possible to uh, have dinner uh, if you're not, like, right on the front lines, to be able to go, go up and have dinner with your kids. And I do think that what he is saying, and he is saying it to men uh, around the country, he's saying it particularly to African-American men, and he's very eloquent on the subject of fatherhood and African American in the African-American community. That's a very important message to send to all men uh, and, and to, to value fatherhood. Uh, it says, but I also think it does make him a better president, right? I want, in first place, if it weren't for talking to his daughters, he'd have no clue what's going on in the digital world. Uh, so, that's, so that's pretty evident. That's oh, true. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, totally. That, we yeah. all we all know that. But just more. So, so I, I, what I wanted to say was, I want a leader who reflects more than the you know who can work the hardest and the, and the longest. Uh, and a final point on that, uh, I've had up to three dinners at various times. Yes, dinner with my kids, uh, and then then up to two uh, afterwards. So I'm sure he probably does have multiple multiple dinners. Uh, but let me end on your point, because it's such an important one, uh, and, and you're quite right. I said hardwired, and I shouldn't have said hardwired, and I was quoting, quoting the article. But yes, what we are discovering, as if we didn't already, again, as I said, if we look at the dramatic change that's taken place over my lifetime, or talk about you know, how we look at same-sex couples, uh, or gays and lesbian and transgender and everything else, that these are, you know, it's some combination of, of, of nature, nurture, who they are, and that's what matters. But the point you make is an extremely important one, that these things reinforce each other, right? So the nature reinforces nurture, and nurture reinforces nature, that we are far more plastic, even biologically, yeah. than we ever recognized. And, and this is exactly where the right place to end, Yes, we are such prisoners, you know, of our particular time in history. I mean, your, your evocation of an 18th century man is wonderful, but even much more recently, pink was a masculine co color. Pink meant pink cheeks. It was a sign of health and vigor, 
right? So pink was a masculine color, and when, so white was baby color forever. And the reason we have two colors, and it was a toss-up as to whether girls would get blue and guys would get pink or vice versa, the reason we have two colors, of course, is good old Madison Avenue, because that way you have to buy two sets of baby things. If you have one color, then no matter which babies you have, a boy and then a girl, they all wear the same. But if you have two colors and you have a boy and then a girl, you gotta go buy a whole new set of stuff. So I think we might wanna end with the power of culture and society and biology <laughs> and nurture, uh, and, uh, but ultimately our ability to push back and our ability to say, I can't change everything, but I can change how I think. I can ask a guy how he's going to cope when he has children. I can, you know, talk differently. I can go home and if my husband is supporting me, I can say, you know, you are a champ. <laughs> you are, and I can value you, and I can, I can, I can not hide that. I can be excited about that, and guys can talk differently about what they value. So this is going to take a lot, but it does start in many ways with culture, the kind of culture on stage, but also the culture that all of us live every day. That's, Thanks very that's much. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a great conversation. That was great.